Welcome to the 11th episode of Season 5 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Tuesday the 17th of July 2012, and in this episode we're going to have a hot topic. Hot and, topic. <laughs> and discuss the entries to our Raspberry Pi competition. We'll of course go over the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, tomorrow's technology today, and go over your feedback and set a brand new competition. If you're listening live, Ooh. you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark, and with me this week are the contradictory Laura... Hello. The nauseating Alan. Hello. And the horribly tacky Tony. Thank you. <laughs> wow, this sounds really good, doesn't it? it? Amazing. Laura, what have you it been up to since, uh, since you were on last? You weren't on the last show, of course. I wasn't. I was on holiday in the rain, so I played a lot of Theme Hospital. Brilliant. Is that the... On Linux. Ah. <laughs> Get the, me. The, the new Ooh. open source port thing. Yeah. Of it. Well, I played for as long as it became unchallenging <laughs> ah. because the earthquakes aren't implemented and oh, right. people don't have vomit epidemics and things so after a while i realized that i was just kind of going through the motions so were you actually running a hospital <laughs> by that point can you yeah. like, basically I'd, I'd run about five or six hospitals they were very impressed with my skills but there wasn't a lot of challenge at certain points can you not make it harder for yourself like speeding it up you would just run around <laughs> like they're in sort of 25 frames to a second film yeah uh, yeah, it's fun. No. yeah, I do like that. My kids love, I love it as well. It. Mm. It's yeah. good fun. So I'm, like. yeah, I'm looking forward to them getting the other bit. They've got a list on their website of all the features they're implementing. So right. things like vomiting epidemics and rats. <laughs> so I'm looking forward oh, the to rats that. Rats are brilliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Need more rats. All software needs more rats. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, what have you been doing? I bought um, a new toy. A right. rubber one? Yeah. Ooh. But this is one I've wanted for a very, very long time. Is it a Vox or Viva? <laughs> no, it's a VT-105. And what's a VT-105? It's a terminal. Uh, like a Not a virtual terminal? No, a dumb terminal. A proper dumb terminal. The green screen one? Uh, no, it's a kind of white screen. Oh, right. Why? Um, uh, <laughs> That's the question we're all asking, Laura. <laughs> I'm the one who said it. So I used to use one when I was at college years and years, years, years ago. Yeah. And it, and it, I, I just had this nostalgic thing that I'd quite like to have one because I like the keyboard. It's got the keyboards on the end of a coily, um, black coily lead and the, the it's just the lovely smell of it when you turn it on and when the val- <laughs> valves, are, it's got valves in it and the right. valves are warming up and stuff and um, it's all over serial. And it's all, well, given that a lot of the stuff I do on a daily basis is in a terminal, I could just as easily use a VT <laughs> terminal and SSH to all the stuff that I want to do. And I thought, why not? And, and it looks nice on the desk. Can you take a picture for us for the show notes? Uh, yes, I can. I haven't got it yet. It's up north. Oh, up oh, north. Okay. I should have got you to go and get it, actually, <laughs> when you were up yeah. on holiday. Um, but yeah, uh, the lovely Graham Bins is going to get it for me. Ah. ah. Yeah. Very nice. Watch out. He doesn't, I don't know, take a photo. Take photos of it or something. <laughs> In compromising yeah, positions. <laughs> <laughs> on a beach. <laughs> so funny, but pictures of him draped over, over with no, draped over it with no shirt on. Uh, mind bleach. <laughs> Tony. Hello. What have you been up to? I've been, I don't know, being terribly tacky or something, apparently. Um, I, yeah, not much. Getting back from holiday and um, getting back into the swing of things, doing some photo processing work and some video processing work. Nothing very exciting. Photos you took on holiday or just photos you've been uh, doing recently? No, photos from a, a wedding that I shot before I went on holiday, so I had to finish uh, that off. You take photos at weddings? Yes, I do. Thank you. Where would somebody go that? to find more of that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's horribly tacky. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Mark? Uh, I've been playing Final Fantasy VII. What's oh, really? that then? What's that? Only one of the most highly acclaimed games ever. It's a RPG. Um, Can't be Theme from Hospital. From was there about, not enough talk about games in the last episode? No, it's from about when I was um, in junior school. Uh, I used to play it with my mate on his PlayStation. A couple of years see, ago then. <laughs> see, everyone looks at me as if I'm some kind of weirdo buying a piece of computer hardware from the past. He buys a anyway, game from the past. <laughs> no, no, I've had this game for ages, but um, I recently found out that they're planning on re-releasing it. And I've just had it sitting on my shelf ever since I've had um, last had a Windows XP machine, which was like when I started uni. And um, I thought, well, I wonder if I can get it going under Wine. And it turns out that you can get it going under Wine if you put Wine in Windows Vista mode which I wasn't huh? expecting. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a bit quirky. So it's actually like, because I, 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 I've tried several times putting it in Windows 98 mode because it's a Windows 95 game and trying all sorts of bits and bobs and it not working. But, you know, I, I just applied a couple of patches and stuck it in Windows Vista mode and oh, it all plays. So I've been playing that. Excellent. I'm happy for you. Yes, <laughs> we all are. 
All right, so it's retro technology today on, it the, is a bit, uh, on isn't the podcast. It? Uh, should we find out about the competition? Let's. Laura, Laura, tell us oh, about the competition. <laughs> I was reading the IRC. Um, yeah, so it. we had a competition about two episodes ago. Yep. And today we're going to announce who the winner is. But first, we're going to put you through everybody's answers to the question. Because so, we haven't decided who's the what, winner yet. What yeah. was the competition for? The competition was to win a Raspberry Pi in a box. In a cardboard box, yes. <laughs> cardboard box. <laughs> the cardboard box it arrived in. Yes. <laughs> you can make some holes in it. You can, you you can make your own box for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a box it's in a box um, yes yeah, so you can win one of those and to do that you had to tell us what you would do with a Raspberry Pi um, if you got one the competition closed yesterday didn't it yes. yeah so if you give us the answers in IRC I'm afraid you're too late yep yeah. yeah. or if you're listening to this yes, you're too late definitely too but late. stay tuned because we're going to launch another competition after we announce the winner of this one yeah so what kind of uh, suggestions did we have well, the first one we had was from, these aren't in any particular order, actually, just the, the order they're in the document, was from Rod, who said he would build a wireless firework launch control platform. Well, I like the sound of that. Yeah. Novel. Do we need to go any further? Is no, that, that's, that's that sounds awesome already. Yeah. No, that's it. I'm just wondering whether he means an actual platform to stand on, because the Raspberry Pi is not really big enough for that. Yeah. <laughs> and it might get <laughs> damaged. Yeah. 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 Likes True. the blue yeah. touch paper. Need to clarify Robert. that, Rod. Yeah. Dominic Rodriguez says, I would use my Raspberry Pi for old school hacking culture and finding ways to use it and taking it apart. Interesting. Well, I didn't think it was dissemblable. Dissemblable? Yes. If you've got a soldering iron. You anything is dissemblable with, <laughs> with a chainsaw. With a <laughs> <laughs> or if you use it as a platform to stand on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's not... It, 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 it's not got any user serviceable parts inside, really. It doesn't really have an inside. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. But the, the box it's, does. It's funny, I know Dominic's quite young, and uh, when I was his age, um, I was taking things apart and not being able to put them back together again so I can relate yeah, to Yeah, I broke a lot of things. Never tried to super do a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So, well, back together again. Yeah. <laughs> He's actually gone red. <laughs> I just <laughs> <laughs> is this when you were in lighting? In the- it's when I was learning lighting. Uh, right, clearly. Very early stages. Day two. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Um, Asao Diff said um, they would build a networked tethered DSLR controller for time lapse for time lapse photography, which I sounds sound like this, quite yeah. a fun idea. Yeah, that does sound good. Yeah. Um, it also said run Super Collider on it uh, and use it for interactive audio projects. Um, if you can get Super Collider to build on ARM, uh, streaming audio using MPD and Icecast. Do we use either of those? Um, yeah, we, sort we, of use, we use Icecast, Icecast. Yes, we for the live stream, yeah. And a remote backup server using rsync and SSH and an open VPN server. Not sure it's going to be powerful to do all of those no, things. Not, <laughs> not at once, one at a time. <laughs> yes, perhaps. maybe. Yeah, Chris Brown said he would make Raspberry Pis with it. <laughs> Yummy. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Good luck with that. Mark McFadden said I would load kids Ruby on the device and would love to use the device to set up a short but fun training course on programming basics for both children and adults. Given the low price of $25 per system, most could afford the device and could use the lessons and kids Ruby to practice the course content. Well, that's good. I'd never heard of kids Ruby. No. No, what it is. no it's a version of Ruby tailored for kids. It's a real project. Right. Okay. Jezra says, I would compile and test Mutton Chop media player on the device, and then I would make a case uh, for the pie out of some stuff in his home or from something purchased at a thrift store. That's right. Charity shop for you UK listeners. Yes. Uh, then That's I'd UK listeners. Program the GPIO to do some sweet stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are not exactly the words he said. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, asterisks don't work on the radio. No, they don't. <laughs> Cool. Andreas said, I'd build my own server with it by installing Debian or Ubuntu server. The Raspberry would run as a headless system providing FTP, SSH, and GNU slash screen. Uh, that's not like GNU slash Linux, that's just GNU screen. 
Um, it would use Twitch. Screen is What's my Twitch? OS. And cron for twittering automatically oh. from the command line. So it must be a command line Twitter client. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, sharing Linux with rtorrent, running rc, and newsbuter, and some other cool stuff. Mm. Yeah, I like the idea of it being an SSH endpoint. Really mm. low power box sat on your network. You know, you could basically yeah. sellotape tape it to your router and just like leave it. <laughs> super glue it. Yeah, or well, super glue Tony. <laughs> Don't super glue me. <laughs> so, um, because it, the, the Raspberry Pi is powered um, via um, US, micro USB, micro USB, the power can come from a USB device. Yeah. So, if you've got a router that's one of these ones that you could plug a hard drive oh, in, yeah, and you're yeah. not currently plugging a hard drive in, you could power it off of that. Mm, which same with the TV. You, yeah, and actually. A thought I had the other day, um, my um, father-in-law has a printer and his wife's just got an iPad mm. and um, she wants to be able to print to the printer, but not all printers are air print enabled. Right. So I thought, put a Raspberry Pi next to the printer, power it off the USB port on the printer, yeah. put it on the network, put Debian mm. on it, cups, share the thing out, and then she can print from her iPad mm. anywhere in the house wirelessly to the Raspberry Pi to the printer. Uh-huh. Awesome. Well, you win the competition. <laughs> Excellent. We didn't put any rules in the set, I invented, did we? Maybe we you get to done. keep your own Raspberry Pi. Let me just add this to the bottom of the document. <laughs> Albert Hickey said he would donate it to the Cork CIT Blackrock Castle Observatory Dojo, which is a hacking dojo, I think, so they can truly get, in the, get it in the hands of kids who are interested in coding. Excellent. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. Nice worthy cause. Robert Hotchkiss of... Very long email. Oh, is that our comment? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Emphasis added. Um, if I get the Raspberry Pi, I will use as many tools such as Inkscape as possible to the development apps and will continue to search for a low-cost computing solution which empowers instead of enslaves the average American worker. Also, I am a socialist Buddhist American. You don't say. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. It's like, as someone else pointed out, the thing about the Raspberry Pi is it is computing for everyone mm. you know it's so dirt cheap that yeah anyone could have one if you can buy one yeah <laughs> robert did have a very good kind of philosophical argument behind his uh, email as well oh, we I had see. to kind of cut, cut cut it down to the meat just for this segment yes. <laughs> john garner said i will try and build a home security system or i will also plan to bring it to og camp more on that later in liverpool in august and could let it run a campfire manager front end that's interesting. Mm. He wins. Yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea. He gets lots of Ooh, points for that. Yeah, plug it into a TV. Yeah. The only problem is it doesn't have wireless. It's wired only. Uh, but it's got a USB port. You could stick a dongle in it. You could. That's yeah. what we did last time. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, true. Zoke mm. says I would send it to Sigflup because she is awesome, and I'd like to see what she could make with one. And in case you didn't hear, and to tug at the heartstrings a little, she did two episodes on Hacker Public Radio recently about being in a mental hospital. So I think she could really do with one, but I don't have one to send her, and they're all sold out, so I can't buy one for her. Um, oh, that's okay. nice, very yeah. nice, good cause. I thought he meant she needed some help for having been on Hacker Public Radio. <laughs> hey, only joking, Ken. <laughs> Graham Rice said he would use a USB to one wire adapter to connect the Raspberry Pi to a one wire digital thermometer and monitor the temperature in my beer fermentation fridge. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Alternatively, if I can find a sensor to monitor weight, then I could also use it to weigh the keg of beer in my serving fridge. How many fridges does one man need? And then calculate how much beer was left in the keg. You need a computer to tell you how much beer is left in a keg. <laughs> <laughs> Some very practical applications there. Well, I like that. I like the idea that you could be sat on on your sofa with a laptop and, you know, SSH into your beer keg and see how much beer there is left in, in it. Just without just have, to have notification bubbles popping up every time yeah. someone takes a pint telling you how many are left. Yeah. Notification bubbles to tell you about the fermentation bubbles. Ooh, mm. see what you did there. Mm. <laughs> We missed him, didn't we, last time? <laughs> <laughs> Joe? There's some that, question marks in that name. Yeah, yeah Joe Paolo Pisani Floor. Somebody with UTF-8 characters in their yeah. name. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. Um, I think the Pi could be used as a very nice and very inexpensive retro game, gaming console. Mm. Well, back to the games. Yay. I would develop or adapt some existing software from the Debian RPI 
images that would allow communication between the Pi and a Wiimote, making the Wiimote behave as a keyboard and mouse for the Pi. The, this Wiimote could then be used more specifically to play old school games in console emulators. In fact, Ooh. I don't think you'd even need to make it behave as a uh, as a keyboard and mouse because a lot of emulators will just accept a gamepad. And when uh, you connect yeah. a, when oh, you right, connect yeah. a Wiimote over Bluetooth, um, it works as a gamepad. Case says, I will build a home server, home automation alarm media system. The Raspberry Pi <laughs> would be situated under my TV, connected by an HDMI cable. I connect it to an external hard disk for serving my home network. Also, it would store images from a connected USB or network camera for security. And I would store media on the hard disk uh, for using on my and my children's other computers. And of course, media for displaying directly. That's quite cool. Tell you what he wants. He wants the world on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice idea, actually, sticking it behind yeah. the telly, because then yeah. at least you know you could turn the telly over to the uh, to the Raspberry Pi channel, <laughs> <laughs> which which could could well be showing the webcam image for you know your house. There was there was someone recently in the Ubuntu UK actually asked um, if they you could put a webcam outside um, pointing at their birds because they have like birds in a cage outside, and whether they could watch it on the TV in the lounge, which is at the other end of the house. I thought that was quite a nice. Your parents do that, don't they? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, they're retired. They're listening now. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, Andrea Lobo sent us a YouTube video, which we will put a link in the show notes, which is very flash. Um, and basically he says, uh, talking about a solar-powered NAS. Yeah, that's quite a cool idea, because obviously yeah. we were just saying it can be powered over USB, so it doesn't need a lot of uh, a lot of juice. No. Yeah, those, um, those solar-powered... Um, Battery things you you buy for mobile phones and for laptops. Mm. So you know you, if you go into a festival or um, going on holiday camping or something like that, you can hang the, the oh yes yes the solar panel out and charge up the reservoir mm. and then plug the device in. And because it doesn't take a lot of power, that would last ages. One mm. of those. Yeah, so I think it's only three watts the Raspberry uh, Pi. So uh, well, that's kind of presumably a peak. So yeah, apparently easily doable for solar. That's an interesting idea. I like that one. Mm. Okay, Ryan Heatherly sent us a long list of things, including make a NAS, use it as a 24-7 uploader, downloader, print server, media centre, and network <laughs> penetration. All at once. Yeah, perhaps yeah, well, yeah. Well, the, hmm. the thing but, is... That a lot of people seem to want it to basically run their torrents for them. <laughs> <laughs> of course, legal torrents of Linux yeah. ISOs. Absolutely. Yeah, I did I notice so. someone say that earlier. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be using it for sharing. Yeah, of course, yeah, Linux only. <laughs> Ingol Schaefer says, I'd like to use it for two student projects at groups in the next semester. I'm working at the university in Bremen as a lecturer to train future math and science teachers. Uh, as part of their training, the students have to do a project during the semester. In the spirit of the Raspberry Pi project, I would support two projects to develop learning resources uh, for and with the device for the areas of linear algebra and analysis. Wow. Wow. That's okay. Cool. So that's kind of the summary of our... Uh, entries that we had there. Amazing so, mix of listeners we have. Yes. Yeah. And it's thank good, you right? everyone for sending in your entries. Yeah. Absolutely. Great Sorry we don't you. have a Raspberry Pi for everyone. No. Yeah. We have we have read if them we all. Did, then we'd say. have one for ourselves as well. Yeah. So who thinks well, I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> Alan's got loads anyway. Uh so who, what do you think? Uh Laura, Mark, Alan? Any particular ones that grab you? Um I, I didn't know we were supposed to choose. I do, I oh. do like the idea of a solar powered NAS. That's just cool. Yeah. Okay. That's quite cute. Um, but I also like the very last one uh, because it, it harks back to the original intention of education. Yeah. Laura, anything in particular? Uh, making pies. <laughs> yeah. That's the one you can't, that's the one thing you can't actually do with it. Oh. Into a pie. You've uh. chosen. <laughs> Should we just pop down the co-op and get a raspberry pie yeah. and just send it to someone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come in a box. <laughs> But, no, I don't have a preference. Okay, well, I, I kind of like uh, two of them really spring to mind. The first one with the fireworks, obviously, because it's fireworks. Yeah, that's cool. true, yeah. And I do like the uh, the last one, the student groups as well. We'll leave it up to you, Tony. Okay. I like the student groups one. Okay, it's like we're heading that direction. That does sound... Have we got a winner? Yep. Yeah. Okay, Ingolf. so Ingolf Schaefer in Bremen. Congratulations, yes. you've just won yourself a Raspberry Pi. Yay. Sorry to everybody else, but if you didn't win the Raspberry Pi, you can listen to this next competition, um, which will give you an opportunity to win something not a million miles away from a Raspberry Pi. It's small and it's a computer, yes. which is an Eco PC. Now, you may remember this Eco PC from a few episodes ago when we reviewed it. 
We did. Uh, episode six of season five, we reviewed it. Um, it it's an EcoPC N1A. Give us a rundown of the specs again, Tony. Okay, uh, off the top of my head, I think it had a... <laughs> 300 gig or the very next line in the yeah. document 300 yeah. gig hard disk uh, 2 gig of ram and a 1.6 atom cpu and it's got you know ports on it and stuff so you can connect things um and a rear of monitor mount and that sort of thing so donated so, by the people at evot who make it that's an airplane going over that's fine <laughs> um but yeah so they've given us this this box to give away which is very kind of them, so thank yeah. you to that thank you to them for that what i meant to say <laughs> <laughs> she's looked at me like there's words missing from that sentence okay so the right. question go on mark tell us what the question the question is what does the evot.biz website that's evot.biz website say the power consumption of the n1.a is is that right n1.a yeah that's the model that's the we're model giving number. away yeah yeah so that's what we use so what is the power consumption of the n1.a Send your entries to competition at ubuntu-uk.org. And that is correct this time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, who pointed that out last time. And the closing date is Monday, the 13th of August, and we'll announce the winner in episode 13. That's not the next episode. That's the one after. Okay. And uh, when you, when you uh, email us your answer to that question, remind us what the question was again, Mark. That was, what does the evot.biz website say the power consumption of the N1.A is? And when you send your entry to competition at ubuntu-uk.org, um, yeah, do the usual and let us know what you would do with it. Yeah. But, as if that's not enough, I hear you say, there's <gasps> I mean, more. that's not all. That is not all. Wow. wow. We have some vouchers. The kind people at evot.biz have given us three vouchers. Now, there's some terms and conditions that apply to these vouchers, but they are for buying hardware from the evot.biz people. It's the EcoPC stuff. So while you're there finding the answer mm, to the question... Buy stuff. If you are tempted to buy stuff, you can do so and save some money. Here is how. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, So Sonny. we've got three codes. The yes. first code gives you, uh, for purchases of $200 or more, Ten dollars discount. Yep, well, that's five percent. Is it? That's pretty good. Yes, okay. yeah, five percent. But it's ten dollars. It's not five. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, how do they get that ten dollars discount, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Tony. Right. They have to enter the following code. Uh, these are all capitals, <laughs> <laughs> except the numbers <laughs> and the symbols. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. All the things that are letters are capitals. G Z question mark nine M Q A H H eight. That's Hotel Hotel 8. Yes. I'll read that again. GZ, question mark, 9MQAHH8. Okay. And the second code we have is for purchase of $400 or more. You get wow. one unit free memory upgrade to 2 gig. So you save about $17 there. Cool. Laura, what's the code for that one? <laughs> it's N0ST, question mark, 31 Two P question mark. Are you sure these aren't Unicode characters that we're just not? I don't. Like? I was hoping. I, there are question marks in the email I had. So yeah. it's N zero smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> and the third code. Oh, oh, we are never doing this again. <laughs> I asked you how that many vouchers familiar. we wanted. Oh. I said we just put them on the website. Oh dear, we're not allowed. No, that's uh, not. No, this is much more fun. <laughs> And pads out the show for half so, an hour. So, so what's the next one. code for, Alan? Third one is a purchase of $600 or more. You get $20 discount and free AC adapter upgrade to 40 watts, which saves you about $35. And the code is... GTZ dollar sign <laughs> W919M0. Awesome. That's a GTZ dollar sign... W919M0. Okay, terms and conditions. Limit one per customer. The vouchers expire on the 18th of August at midnight. They're valid from tomorrow. That's the 18th of July. Online and registered to customers only at the online store. A coupon cannot be used at the same time as another coupon. Presumably. You've got to notice the, uh, the midnight is... The time uh, zone. Is the uh, Korean, Korean time. time zone. Yes, so make sure you factor that into That's your, earlier your than ours. We're, we're not making any kickbacks off this, are we? No, we get nothing <laughs> for reading out these spurious codes. Yeah. This was just something nice that... that we did for you. We do yes. for, our, yeah. for our listeners. The nice people at nice Evop Biz enough. sent us these vouchers. We thought we'd share them with you. We can't put them in the, in the uh, show notes because of, that would be a kind of violation of what we agreed with the people. <laughs> we have to listen back to the show. Hopefully we said them correctly. 
Okay. Uh, if they <laughs> if don't we work, didn't get in touch. Please get in touch with them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will be fine though. Oh man. Right. Should we get on with the news? Yes. Retailers selling the Raspberry Pi have lifted the limit of one unit per order. Despite a lead time on orders of up to 11 weeks, manufacturer of the ARM-based computer is currently running at 4,000 units a day. Wow. Which is quite awesome. I saw uh, an interview with Eben Upton who said that when they first started, he thought they'd sell about 10,000 units. <laughs> and now wow. they're selling 4,000, well, they're making 4,000 a day. That's amazing. That's pretty good coming. Yep. Marissa Mayer has been announced as the new CEO of Yahoo! Formerly a top executive for Google, Mayer joined the search giant in 1999. By search giant, we mean Google, not Yahoo, of course. (laughs) As their 20th employee. The appointment sees Yahoo's fifth new CEO in as many years. Wow. Good luck to her. So let's make a note for next year, uh, this episode next year, see if she's still there. Yeah. Mm. She may turn it around. She's got a very formidable reputation. Really? Oh, Mm. cool. Addy Cohen of IBM Application Security Research has posted an article on the IBM Security Insider blog demonstrating a vulnerability in Windows Explorer allowing arbitrary commands to be injected and executed. Ooh. This is quite interesting to see how it's done because basically it's to do with the way that when you say run a file with this program, it basically just runs the command with whatever the file is, what well, the whole part of the file just stuck on the end. And so you can do sort of similar to how you can do an SQL injection attack on a web application, but you just sort of put a special character in. Um, what, like a dot, dot, slash to well, go yeah, up well, the tree? No, you sort of, you put you put quotes in, it thinks, oh, it's, that's the end of the command, <laughs> and then you put something else. But normally Windows won't let you do that. However, if you're on a Samba share, Samba doesn't check, and there's no escaping of it at the Windows mm. end because it thinks that no one will have been able to enter it in the first place. So it lets you do things like, if you say open with command line, then it will just... Um, like run whatever command the share is called and nice. things like that. It's yeah, it's interesting to see. Uh, That's rather cunning. Works. Yeah, clever stuff. The European Commission are investigating a breach of Microsoft's browser choice agreement, allowing it to requiring it to allow users to choose which browser to install on Windows Seven rather than defaulting to Internet Explorer. It's alleged that since Windows Seven Service Pack One was released in February, the browser choice screen has not been displayed to users. Microsoft described the issue as a technical error mm. isn't everything that microsoft do a technical error? <laughs> oh you can't escape those quotes <laughs> goodness I, 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 as everyone keeps pointing out internet explorer is the best browser for downloading other browsers yes is it? Well, well yeah once you've downloaded another oh, browser yeah. you never need it again mm. do you Jolla, the Finnish mobile phone startup, has announced a deal with China's largest mo- smartphone retailer, D Phone, to distribute Mego based handsets, a move which sees new commercial interest in the all but abandoned mobile platform. Presumably they're cheap. What's cheap? Well, the Mego based phones. Well, we don't know yet. I mean, they've only just spun out from Nokia. Mm. So these are a whole bunch of people. I think it's like 100 people or something like that who spun out from mm. Nokia and started Jolla. Um, and did they, did they, were they spun out, or did they just walk out and? No, it's start part off? of a part of a, a, it's a program deal. that Nokia okay. have to let people do that, right? Okay, and cool. I believe Nokia have handed over some patents to them, mm. so mm. it's not just a you know a shell company that's just mm. got a bunch of very clever people. It's got very clever people and some intellectual property as well. I think when Nokia got into bed with Microsoft, everybody thought that would be the end for Mego and um, its other yeah. mobile platform, the name of which temporarily Mel Temi. That's the one. Well, Mel Temi apparently has been shut down right. as a result of the layoffs that, that happened recently. Mm. Um, but there's also other companies who are carrying on a fork of Mego, aren't they, called Tizer? Tizen. No, that's, Tizen. The, no, that's the Intel one. Oh, right. That's not, no, that's, that's not Mego. No, that's not. That's completely different. That's Intel's own. And okay. there is a single Tizen handset, and I think you can get it in the UK. The, there's an orange on the Orange network. Hmm. You can get a Tizen. And I think it's, it's um, because it's Intel, it's x86 x86 phone instead oh. of an arm phone ah yes I, I think I saw an advert for that I didn't realise yeah. it was I, d- I just looked at the advert and just boggled as to why, <laughs> why someone would want an x86 phone but then you know yeah, stranger things have happened at sea cool and that's... <laughs> with that philosophical note <laughs> 
Oh, it's me. Um, yep. <laughs> sorry, can't read my name. Um, there's the Ubuntu UK Barbecue on Saturday the 28th of July. July. <laughs> She's looking around to get that right. Um, and it's at uh, Alan Bell's house, who's the current yes. guy who's... And his mom. address is... <laughs> yes, and he lives... Well, I don't think there's any secret to say he lives somewhere in Farnham. Um, <laughs> it was looking at me as if I've given away the crown jewels there. Um, no, uh, you'll have to ask him for his address. Yes. The details are on the Loco team website, loco.ubuntu.com. Cool. cool. He did manage to invite the whole world by oh, yeah, Google+. That, Plus. Yes, yes, he did. So uh, it's, it's <laughs> not a secret. <laughs> yes. Um, Og Camp, of course, is happening Hooray. in like a month. Like a month? Like actually a month from like today. really like actually a month or just awesome. in a month? No, oh my in, god, in a month. Right. In not only like a month but also actually a one month, month from right. today from tomorrow is the, from tomorrow is the first day. Well, we'll be link there. overboard. Um, <laughs> so anyway, if you're gonna go, <laughs> book the hotel because we've just had had word from our man in Liverpool, Dan Lynch, that there are only twenty rooms left. Wow, Ooh. that's really good and. It's, it's a big hotel. It's a big hotel, and they're, it, we, they've done us a really good deal. So if mm. you're going to book a hotel, then book that one, because we'll all be there. Yeah, And all the social stuff will be there. And um, it's really near to the venue, really near to the train station, really cheap. So what more could you ask for? And all the details are on the oddcamp.org website for yes. how you get in contact for the hotel. It's the Adelphi. Yep. And uh, we're just confirming the last few speakers now. Uh uh, open Rights Group are oh. making an appearance on the main stage. Ooh. And uh, you may have heard Mr. Stephen Fry is going to be... Who? ...virtualising <laughs> himself into existence... Uh, that filthy thing. ...on the main stage <laughs> by the wonders of technology. And there's an opportunity cool. to ask him questions, I think. Um, is that- we're, we're collecting questions to uh, in advance to, to send to him to have answered Okay, so, so if you, org and you yeah, can if you, if you email to... Well, if you, if you find us on, on a social network and say... Um, like there's a post saying, "What would you ask Stephen Fry?" If you reply to that, cool. Then uh, do it this week because we, you know, he's he's a busy guy, and uh, we need to make sure that he actually gets our questions in time. Excellent. So Breeza uh, asked on our Ubuntu UK podcast Etherpad for a little bit more information about our camp for a first timer. What to expect? I don't think we've talked about it too much. We've been quite high level. Yeah. So it's an unconference. An unconference. What does that mean? Um, it means that it's conference largely without a schedule, like okay. a bar camp, like a bar okay. camp. But well, we have we have three or four and a bit tracks. Okay. Um, so we've got one scheduled track where we we're going to publish schedule in advance, so you know who you're going to see on there. But then there's going to be other stages where there's no schedule at all, and you turn up and you say, "I want to talk about this," and we'll have a system called Campfire Manager, which is written by a member of the community, John the Nice Guy Spriggs. What a who's nice guy! Awesome, and a team of a few other people who are also awesome. Buy them beer. Um, so you can say I want to do this talk and people will say yeah I'd like to hear that and then it will go up on the schedule and um, so yeah the, the um, sort of event puts itself together through the day and you can cool. talk about basically whatever you want to do with open source free culture free music whatever so the, the, the key thing is we don't know exactly what's going to be going yeah. on um, but people can have the opportunity to do whatever they feel like exactly really. and you can yeah you don't have to give a talk it's great if you want to but otherwise you can just sit and listen to other people's talks mm-hmm. there's also going to be um uh, bite marker setting up a gaming rig. Um, there's probably going to be Minecraft or something multiplayer mm-hmm. on there. Cool. Um, there's going to be uh, a- an open hardware summit. So there's going to be people running workshops and doing talks on open hardware. There's going to be a geek nick. So we're all going to sit outside and uh, sponsored by O'Reilly. Oh, right. I should yes. I should also mention <laughs> Bite Mark are sponsoring the event. Um, so if you want to buy a VPS. Buy it from them. Excellent. <laughs> um, and we're also hosted by the Liverpool John Moore University, uh, which is where the event is going to be. Um, and they basically just provided us with the venue and done a lot of stuff to help us out. Aww, so um, That's brilliant. Big so, thank you to them. Mm. So it's a mixture of scheduled talks, unscheduled events and happenings, technology, hardware, hands-on. And breakout gaming, areas. And, yeah. Uh, social spaces. Is yeah. there a bar? Um, there's there's going to be sort of refreshments right. in the in the venue, but then we're going to have um, a, we're we're going to go to a bar the night before just as an informal get together for people cool. who came the night before, and there will be a social event probably in the hotel, but more on the Saturday the night, Saturday. right? Um, where there'll be much beer being had and much fun being had. But we'll publish all the details of that on the website so you know what's going on. That's ogcamp.org. 
Yes, so come along. It's going to be a laugh. It's been a blast the last three years, and I'm sure this year won't be any different. I'm yep. really looking forward to it. Yep. Excellent. Cool. Um, we've had a submission about emfcamp.org, so we're just going to play you a little trailer about that. Electromagnetic Field is a three-day camping festival for people with an inquisitive mind or an interest in making things. Instead of music, you'll find talks and hands-on workshops being given by hackers, artists, scientists, craft people, geeks and engineers. By the time the festival is over, you'll have learnt new skills, made new friends and been given a lot to think about. You may even have made lightning, flown a drone and learned a cracker safe, all on the same day. EMF is being held in Milton Keynes from the 31st of August to the 2nd of September. Tickets are on sale now. Find out more at emfcamp.org. So that came from Selexius in the RIRC mm-hmm. channel. Mm-hmm. And when, I, when he said, EMF camp, can we play your trailer? I said, that's unbelievable. And he didn't get it. <laughs> You're old. <laughs> what? We know. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, go, yeah, back to your, well. go back to your Witchcraft 7 or whatever it's called. <laughs> we also had a trailer for the Ohio Linux Fest. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Lift off. We are counting down to the 10th annual Ohio Linux Fest. Join us in Columbus for a weekend jam-packed with your favorite open-source software. On Friday, get professional training at Ohio Linux Fest Institute, or come to see the early Penguins talks. Saturday brings a full set of presentations, including the new Beginners Track. Don't forget to stop by the display booths featuring prominent vendors and community projects. Sunday wraps up with LPI and BSDA certification exams, as well as the diversity and open-source workshop. It all happens September 28, 29, and 30 at the Greater Columbus Convention Center. Visit ohiolinux.org for all the details. <laughs> Blend of that into our music's not right. <laughs> I'm just amazed it's all still hanging together. Right, that's the end of the very long news and events, everybody. Hello and welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners wherever you are around the British Empire, or indeed, never wallop. And it's a good day to our severe disciplinarian, Miss Deirdre Morris Oxford. Good day, Douglas. I believe we're speaking today with the inventor of a remarkable new personal navigation device, Mr Rafferty Humblebum. How does that work, Deirdre? It pinpoints your position by radio triangulation from a number of base station transmitters. No, completely over my head. Uh, Doing what, exactly? It triangulates your position against a map. But I know where I am on the map. Not when we bailed you out of Charing Cross Police Station last night for being drunk and disorderly. Uh, hmm. Uh, Perhaps we should ask Mr Rafferty Humblebum to explain his invention. There's a slight technical hitch, Douglas. Mr Humblebum is stuck in the revolving doors downstairs. A slight navigational error, what, Deirdre? Uh, Fear not. According to our producer, it seems we have a standby guest, Mr Phil In. Yes, mm, Phil In. Oh, Fill in. Ah, yes. Well, uh, it reminds me of a chum of mine, the Right Honourable Kenneth Everett, when he went to join the RAF. Uh, This RAF waller says we're going to have to test you to make sure you're the right sort of chap to have in the squadron. Uh, Dear Kenny says, righto, test away. The RAF chap says, first off, can you say air? Uh, So Kenny says, air. RAF chappy says, jolly good, now can you say hair? Uh, Kenny says, hair. The RAF chap says splendiferous. Uh, lastly, can you say lair? Uh, dear Kenneth says lair. The RAF bod says, now to finish off, uh, can you put them all together? Uh, so Kenny says, air, hair, lair. The RAF chap claps him on the back and says, just the chap, welcome to the RAF, you're in. <laughs> uh, c- come along, Deirdre. Fascist. I say, Deirdre. Thank you very much. Well, that's all from tomorrow's technology today. A total pip and God save the king.
Now it's time for our hot topic. Hot, hot topic. topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, all want so this is a segment where we have a, a sort of debate between uh, two parties uh, on, a, on a hot topic. Um, hot topic. And then uh, we take some questions from you in the IRC channel if you're, uh, if you're mm. awake, listening live and awake. Um, <laughs> and then, and then, then we, we'll decide who wins the argument uh, debate, that is. So... Um, <laughs> Today's hot topic. Hot topic. <laughs> um, tweak. Uh, in fact, not is it today or well, yesterday? Valve Software, who create the Steam client um, and uh, games on the Source Engine, which you may know, Half Life, Portal, um, Left for Dead, games like that, um, have announced that the rumors are true, and they are going to port the Steam client to Linux and Left for Dead Two as the first game. Uh, which is going to be supported on Ubuntu first, um, as they make sure it works, and hopefully in the end supported on other platforms. So today's hot topic is: Should we welcome proprietary software on Linux? And um, for the motion, we have Alan Pope, and against the motion, we have Tony Whitmore. So, Alan, <clears throat> should we welcome proprietary software on Linux? Okay, I'd rather answer a different question. <laughs> it's hardly okay, interesting. Should we welcome users of proprietary software to Linux? And I think yes, we should. Because right now, the people who run software like Steam do so on Windows and OS X, two entirely proprietary platforms. They buy games and downloadable content, which is almost all proprietary. So they have a triple whammy of non-free in the OS, the store, and the games. So right now, all we're doing is actually replacing one bit of that, the OS. Free software developers have chosen to make our platform available as open source software. That's their choice. And we built our platform upon those foundations. We could certainly put pressure on companies to open source their work, but that's a separate discussion from accepting their existing bodies of work. The fact is many people are already effectively boycotting our OS because they want to run a product which isn't available on our platform. Once it is, I'm certain we'll see wider adoption of our OS as a result. Also, those people who buy computers and licenses to run other software too. Buying computers and software keeps the companies that contribute to open source and free software in business. Red Hat, IBM, Intel and Nokia wouldn't be where they are today uh, (laughs) without people buying software licenses and kit to run it on. There is an argument that the software we're buying should be free and open source, but the fact is right now it isn't. There's many other issues like will they port it to ARM and will they support LTS and non-LTS releases of Ubuntu and other distros. But the fundamental fact remains, people want this stuff on our platform. So we should welcome it with welcoming arms and a cautious eye. Mm -hmm. Mm. And against the motion, Tony. Keep it short. (laughs) Sorry, you're falling asleep. Yeah. Right. I saw the essay you were writing before. Well, listen closely. GNU, and any speech that starts with those three letters is going to be a good one, isn't it? (laughs) GNU was founded for a reason. Proprietary software restricts freedoms. Nearly 30 years ago, Richard Stallman recognised that the interests of software companies do not always align with the interests of the software, with the users of the software. And the same is still true today. Whilst we have free software kernels, development tools, window managers, desktop applications and games, we risk losing our freedoms in other areas, relying on third parties to sign bootloaders, proprietary BIOSes with more and more functionality, patent incumbent codecs, console and PVR manufacturers who prevent people tinkering with them. I'm the first to recognise the shortfalls of some FLOS applications compared with their proprietary equivalents. Anyone who's used the video editing software available on Ubuntu or tried the plethora of photo workflow applications will know the pain. A dozen different applications, and none of them doing exactly what is available in the mainstream commercial equivalents, or at least not reliably. Yet, it is important to persevere. If we don't, we end up doing exactly what the creators of the, the creators of the software want, paying them to let us work in the way they want. The goal of GNU is not to become the most successful, however one measures that operating system. It is to preserve its users' freedom. Nobody would doubt that having Photoshop, Premiere, World of Warcraft or whatever on Linux would encourage people to adopt it. But what benefit is using a free software kernel and window manager just to access proprietary applications? You might as well use Mac OS X. At least it's pretty. (laughs) Alan would no doubt say that companies making their applications available on Linux is a sign of a healthy software ecosystem. It is. 
It means that people want to be part of your success. But don't forget what made Linux successful in the first place. It's not the mascot. It's not the user experience. It's not the low barrier to entry for new users. It's the freedom that everyone has. From Red Hat and Canonical to Nick Beard Hacker in his bedroom to take a system running Linux and make it do whatever you want. The easy way out is not necessarily the right way. Listen to RMS. Just say no. <laughs> oh, wow. Alan, do you have anything to say in response to Tony? Um, yeah, I can understand the, the free software argument, but the fact is we've already made steps down the road of non-free. Uh, our laptops have non-free drivers. They have non-free uh, firmware. Um, you know, we, we already utilize uh, non-free web services like Gmail. We already use non-free um, applications when we file our taxes and so on. I think we're already so far down that road that to to say no to the next step, which is to allow these software vendors on our platform, is churlish. So what is the point of using Linux as opposed to Mac OS X? It's better. Yeah, Tony, you said you said that, that you said <laughs> you said the reason that, that people use Linux in the first place is because of the freedom. Do you not think that there's an element of people using it because it's technically better solution? No, I, I said that the the purpose of GNU was freedom. Right. Not that's necessarily that's what people use it. People you can use it for any sort of reason they want. They can use it for running a nuclear power station, they can use it for a chemical weapons program if they want, they can use it whatever they like. That's inherent in the freedoms that they have. Um the measure of success of an operating system is not necessarily um, it's num the number of people who have adopted it. Success for GNU will be an entirely free op application stack that people can just use and do what they need to do it on. It doesn't matter whether that's on 1% of the world's computers or 100. But we'll never get there if if all we, we do is say you can't have those shiny things you you but what you can have is this single laptop that has an open firmware bios and a, a no wireless card and um a video that can't do pretty effects that you already have on all those other computers you've ever seen in your life i agree so i think we should build the pretty things we should make those applications <clears throat> on the platform that we have got and linux is a great platform you know the kernel you know the ui that sort of layer is working really well and it does look nice now you know, five years ago, it probably didn't very much. Now it does. We need to get the applications right as well. We still don't have a really good office suite. Really? That is, well, that is directly comparable and compatible with Microsoft Office. Okay. There are still lots of Office idiosyncrasies that don't work in LibreOffice, for example. We don't have a really good uh, video editor. We so don't have... So doesn't that say that the free software model doesn't work? If you say, okay, we've got a great kernel and we've got something that looks vaguely pretty now, not quite, you know, perfect, but it's prettier than it was five years ago, okay. Mm. But we with this free software stack, we still don't even have an office product. How are we even how are we ever gonna get um class, you know, triple A class games and um multi million dollar uh, investment in games that run on our platform that are open source if we can't even get something like an office suite working. Exactly. I, I'm not sure whether focusing on games is a really good thing for us to put our efforts in. I think we're much more likely to get a successful, um, something like an office suite if the, if it's developed and stewarded in the right way. And I think that's where the problem has been historically with, with open office is that it has been not stewarded correctly and so its development has been slowed down um whereas if you look at some of the things that companies like red hat and canonical have looked after they have become successful and adopted in mainstream linux desktops not just their own distributions uh, if if we could get somebody to open source proprietary applications that would provide those missing bits of the linux desktop great uh, if we can't we've got to make what we have got work okay if i could um just bring a new element to discussion the we've we've seen some proprietary games come to ubuntu recently through the uh the humble indie bundle um but something else which is going to come in with steam is drm now steam has quite a um quite a, a strict drm system built in in that you have to have an account with steam you have to be online when you want to launch the game otherwise it won't register and every time um in my experience yes um and 
do you think that um, we should be exposing Ubuntu users to this? Is this not just going to be um, something which you know they they currently don't have to deal with? No software on um, on Ubuntu currently really behaves like this. Do we want Ubuntu users to be exposed to that? Um, well, they. There's a difference between exposing our users to it and forcing our users to have it. At the moment, we, we nobody's forcing them to have Steam. Nobody's forcing them, well, when it comes out, nobody will force them to have Steam. Nobody's forcing them to um, uh, to install DRM-enabled games. You can still install Tux Paint if you want to, and not Tux Paint, Tux Racer, sorry, or any number of other games that are in the repository, which are free software, you know, in the terms of the... Um, GPL and other open source licenses. You can still do that. No one's forcing you. Yes, if you want the game from um, Rockstar Games or whoever makes the, the, the game that you want, you, you have to accept their terms. It's their product. In the same way that when you take our CD, you have to accept our terms, the terms of the GPL or whatever other licenses the software is under. If you want someone else's stuff that they made, you have to accept the terms of the license they made it under. Okay. Uh, we have a, a few questions from the IRC channel. Um, Ovidius um, comments that this means two different infrastructures for updating software. You'd have the stuff which you can install through apt-get and the Ubuntu Software Center, and you'd have stuff which you install through Steam. So, um, you know, is it good for us to have bring in basically another package manager? It's not great, is it? And one of the strengths of Ubuntu is always that centralized package management and the fact that you can get it get stuff from repositories, manage it all in one place. Mm -hmm. In an ideal world, it would be great if I could do app get install Steam and app get install Half-Life. Yeah, that that would be really cool. And, you know, it all just magically under the covers work or, you know, go to the software center and type in the name of a game and it figure out all the underlying guts and get it from the right place and figure out if I've ever bought it on Steam and mm -hmm. get it from Steam and it all just be a deb that I could copy across to another machine and install it over there as well. Or, you know, what it, that would all be lovely. Yeah. Um, and I think that could happen. Could you package a proprietary thing as a deb? Yep. Yeah, you do we have loads of proprietary stuff yeah. in, in the Ubuntu software center already. Um, so I, that's that's a that's a technical problem that could be solved by a technical means. Whether they will, hmm, don't know. Do you think that we should say we don't want you here unless you're going to do this? No, because then we wouldn't have Google Chrome. Okay. Yes, I agree with that. It's it's a free platform. People can do whatever they want if they want to put out brilliant or half baked package management systems that people can install on top of their own platform. Go I, for it. I, I give you the counter. How does Desura? update itself which is the open source uh basically equivalent i'm not going to use the word rip off but <laughs> equivalent of steam there is desura or desura or however you pronounce it and it looks and acts exactly like steam but it, the the client i believe is now open source we've talked about this before how does that update itself as i understand it it's inbuilt and does it itself right. it doesn't use a deb uh. so yeah there is already precedent unfortunately, yeah. and we're going down the same road that Windows and the Mac have, which they are now trying to get away from, which is <laughs> they're, they're trying to get towards having an app store. The Mac has an app store. Yeah. Windows 8 has an app store. We have Software Center, and yet we've already had that for years, and we are going away towards you know having separately packaged and installed software with its own update mechanism. No, that's not ideal. Maybe we should just call it an app store, and years ago we could have been there. <laughs> Well, yes. <laughs> Get sued by Apple. Yeah. Right. Well, um, thank you both for your, your lively debate and um, your, your um, yes, good arguments. I, I try, try not to use the word lively twice in the same sentence. Um, they weren't that lively. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Tony did gesture quite a lot on the radio. Yes. It's, uh, it's good, to, good to see it. that yeah. for us anyway. Um. <laughs> Well, we've had um, a bit of good old discussion in the IRC channel while you two have been chatting, and uh, it seems that uh, by a unanimous vote, <laughs> uh, the winner <laughs> of today's hot topic is hot topic. Alan. Oh, oh. oh. that's oh, rubbish. Bang goes freedom. 
Yeah, well, it was fun <laughs> while it lasted, everybody. <laughs> apparently, apparently, I might be wrong about Steam always requiring you to be online, but um, I've never been able to play a game without being online mm. through Steam. Well, if you were listening to that and you thought Alan was wrong and I was right, why not email in podcast <laughs> at ubuntu-uk.org or even if you thought Alan was right and I was wrong, email in podcast at a uh, podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. That's the one. Yes. Thank you, Mark. Okay. It's time for the bit about Ubuntu now. Dell. Thank you. And Dell has launched the beta phase of Project Sputnik, a program to develop an Ubuntu-powered Ultrabook aimed squarely at developers. Mm, or aimed at really square cool. developers. This is the laptop that looks a bit like a MacBook Air and is Ooh, really pretty yeah. and nice. And yeah, and yeah. they're doing a... You can, a, you can buy a, them at the moment running. You with can, those. yeah. The, and they're doing an Ubuntu build for it. Mm. Um, so what's the big deal with this then, if, if you can already buy it? Well, the goal is to make it something that's attractive for um, DevOps, WebOps. I think we talked about this in the last episode oh, yeah. or maybe before. Something that um, currently, if you you know, if you go to a, um, a typical company, IT people who you know are doing development or sysadmin, if they're buying their own machine, often they will actually buy a Mac mm-hmm. um, rather than a PC, and. Dell have recognised that that's possibly a market that they should get in on. Yeah, um, they, so. they've said. You know, I was reading some of the sort of you know the thought behind the project because at the moment this is a project to sort of build a um, a system rather than actually you know something that which they're already selling and then they hope to have a marketable product mm-hmm. afterwards. But they were saying that as far as they know, this is the only time that a company has ever said we are going to build a machine aimed just at developers, mm. which is quite cool. Yeah, excellent. And the idea is it comes with, you know, whatever tools you need, you know, whether it's yeah. Git or Subversion or, you know, Ruby and everything just works. Mm. So, you know, you can get going very quickly and easily. So you can sign up for a beta test on their website. Mm. Wicked. A refined compacted session indicator has landed in Ubuntu 12.10. Yes. It's basically the, the user menu, the one that's got your name at the top. And the system menu that's got the sort of cogwheel power button at the top, all in the <laughs> top, right? Yeah. Ever. All collapsed into a single menu. Yes, and some stuff removed as yeah. well. So it's not ah, got yeah. things like it's not got the display and printers and printers. Oh. It's just got system settings, and then you can get to the stuff through there. Yeah. So it hasn't got the two things that I use. Then. Yeah, the two things that are quite handy, being quite shortcuts. <laughs> right. We're just, so, giving, we're just passing on feedback. Blame yeah. blame Matthew Paul Thomas, not me. Okay. Oh, MPT. Yes. Oh. Voting for the Ubuntu app showdown has begun with 133 approved entries. Alan, is one of yours? No. <laughs> one no. of yours? Yours one of Don't them. ask. Oh, dear. <laughs> no. Did you not but, get it finished? Did Sophie not finish it for you? <laughs> <laughs> She's still colouring it in. So I think they had like 150 entrants and 133 were approved uh, for various reasons. The others didn't, either the developers didn't respond or they didn't respond quickly enough or something. Or well, employees of Canonical weren't allowed to enter. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, no, there's, there's Canonical people have entered. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, yeah, voting has started. So you can download the apps... Yep. Uh, the link uh, that we'll put takes you to a page that's just got a giant list of applications and you can go through them and play, uh, install them fairly easily and um, play them. Cool. Yeah, play with them. Excellent. There's, there's all kinds of stuff in there. There's one that's really, really nice that I, I saw was a really, really nice RSS reader. Mm-hmm. It's really, really you know clean and beautiful. Nice mm-hmm. desktop app. Excellent. Cool. And finally, Jim Hodap and Thomas Mashos have begun to blog uh, weekly updates from the Ubuntu TV project. Yes, I have the first one here. Mm. And it's got some stuff in it about Unity and lenses and scopes and stuff. It's quite short and to the point, so you just get the headlines and not much more. Yeah. Um, but it's There's some... two now. Uh, I think oh, right, okay. we've done a couple of updates. Um, so Jim works on the Ubuntu TV project um, such that it is at the moment and uh, for Canonical and Thomas, Thomas Mashos is a community guy. So they yeah. got together and thought, let's get some information out there. So, you know, people, because people keep dropping by the IRC channel and asking what's going on and, you know, people want to know. Thomas has emailed into the show, hasn't he? Yes, Several he has. Times, I yes. Think. Yeah. yeah, he's a long time uh, Mythbuntu user and um, contributor, I think. Excellent. Well, that's all in the bit about Ubuntu and in the not about Ubuntu, CentOS 6.3 has been released following in the footsteps of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6.3 at the end of June. Mm. And there was much rejoicing. 
Yeah. yeah. So people have recompiled Red Hat and taken all the logos and stuff out and released it. Yes. Which is good. So you get Red Hat well, the reason, for nothing. The reason I stuck that in there is because, you know, people have said that, you know, CentOS is dying and there's uh, there's no people actually working on it anymore. And this shows, you know, pretty quick turnaround from 6.3 rail in June to 6.3 yeah. CentOS now. That's, That's good. Good, good to see. Good well, yeah. I mean, lots of people use CentOS, so mm. it's not going to go away. Pretty much every every client I've had who's not, you know, been where I was working has always had CentOS on their servers. Oh, it wow. just seems to be the thing that people put in place. Mm-hmm. Wow, we'll have to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the bit about and not about Ubuntu this week. It's time for your feedback. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> we had lots of feedback about the last episode, much more than we usually get. Why is that, oh, Alan? Was it good? Because <laughs> the audio sucked. Uh, thanks to everyone who wrote in or left a comment on Twitter, Google Plus, or hate mail via the website. Uh, here's a typical one from Alex Mayer. I noticed that the background music during the news and between each section was very loud. And some of the people speaking were too quiet to hear over the music. I hope this email's helpful and I uh, hope that it's not a problem in future shows. I've been using Ubuntu since the 1104 release and I really enjoy your show. I really appreciate what your guys are doing. Thanks, Thanks, for your Thanks Alex. That Thank was a really that's, nicely written email, wasn't it? I that's that was... one of the more polite ones. <laughs> yeah. 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 I believe, so, in fact, we did actually have someone who offered to take the flack and remaster it for us, didn't yes, they? Yes, yes. Um, I did my best with it. In, uh, once I realised that people were actually complaining about going deaf, Yes. Uh, I thought I, I'd, I'd do what I could with it. Yes. But yeah, just to say we do, basically we do it live and then we put it out and we never listen to it really before we put it out. So last week was no different apart from the fact that we were at Alan's house. And <laughs> and I had very little equipment yes. to get this thing rigged up uh, and a quick trip to Maplin <laughs> about an hour beforehand <laughs> for some missing parts. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm just looking longingly at uh, Tony's giant mixer. Oh, mixer. Yeah. <laughs> You. <laughs> Mine's much smaller in comparison, yeah. and uh, many less, less, knobs. less features. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But yes, it's it's something that um, you know we always try to do well. But when you listen to the first few episodes we ever did, there were all sorts of problems with the uh, yeah. audio level and things. And is there a car along going on? Yeah, I think so. Is it my car? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've said it a God, few times now including around on twitter but it's really really impressive that alan managed to spin all the plates at once to get <laughs> yeah. the thing streaming live yeah, you would not believe Any how sound. many things he was doing at once while yeah. trying to have a conversation recording <laughs> and, the other, and the thing is like normally i mean we were all chatting on irc to give him feedback as he went along and there was no way he was going to read it because it's hard enough monitoring irc anyway at the best yeah. of times and of course, with only two of them in the studio, mm. they were having to do twice as much content yeah, <laughs> yeah. talking as well as pressing buttons and fading yeah. things and so. So I am sorry. It, it was very good. It won't happen again. It's, it's good. <laughs> I just think it's good to know that there are only people who do listen to the show yeah. and, <laughs> are prepared and to obviously know. care about it that passionately. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of passion. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ah, um, and another piece of news slash feedback. The show is now available through hobbytechradio.com. And this is a quote from their website. Mark Johnson, presenter of the Ubuntu UK... Really? Presenter? One of the presenters of the Ubuntu UK (laughs) podcast. Presenter, thank you. (laughs) Commented, thanks for your interest in the show. We look forward to broadening our listener base with this exciting service. Or something like that. Did you actually say that? I said some of that. (laughs) (laughs) Some of those words you might once have said. But not necessarily. Not necessarily. (laughs) (laughs) So what's Hobby Tech Radio? Um, Basically, it's a sort of um, a, a continuous stream of uh, sort of like an internet radio station where oh. it's sort of aggregated a load of tech podcasts so if you fancy listening to something you can just tune into the stream and there'll be a podcast playing Neat. so tux yeah. radar are on there and we're on there and a few other podcasts are on there excellent oh that's yeah. good and that's the end of the feedback <laughs> That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with our web 
with our website, with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Join us on Tuesday the 31st of July for our next live episode. I don't think I'll be here. I won't be here. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> this is familiar. Hang on. The last time we had an episode with just two people. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to get a stunt Alan and a stunt, a stunt Laura. Laura. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see if we can find some people. Volunteers to podcast that. <laughs> Are you, any, anywhere interesting? Anything nice? Isle of Man. Ah. ah. Work? Yeah. Right. North Carolina. <laughs> Not work? PhD. Uni. Ah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, while you two are jet setting off around the world, Mark and I will be here. Yeah, hard at it. Not sure I call uh, either uh, jet, <laughs> at jet the podcast. setting. <laughs> Just sit there and count your tax savings. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, that's the end of a long show. Oh, yes. But, but uh, yes, I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole kind of hour and five, hour and seven minutes all the way through. Yes, oh, we um, didn't even break for a cup of tea. I so know. We didn't people who listen in the car, please don't complain. <laughs> yeah, I hope we've done it slightly better this time. Can't yeah. people just pause it and then listen later? What? You just think. I've never quite understood that. Some people burn to CD. We love you all. <laughs> we love you all. Thanks for listening. We do it better. Bye. 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 Bye.